Let's get started. Continue what we ended last time is uh, we're trying to explain why after the Newton's cradle stopped or stops, why it won't restart by itself. Okay, the reason is the heat dissipated as heat in the environment. And uh, due to the flip, like uh, the frictions of, 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 of when, when the balls clicking with each other. And this process of heat being dissipated in the atmosphere caused the entropy to increase. Okay, and then we started the concept called entropy. That is the measure of how much energy gets dispersed or a description of the disorder or randomness of the system. Okay, like we mentioned last time, we care more about the change of entropy than the entropy or the value of entropy itself at a certain moment. What we care most is during the process whether an entropy increases or decreases. Like we said, when Newton's cradle stops, when the heat gets dissipated in the air, this process causes the entropy to what? To increase because the heat gets what? More dispersed, okay, more dispersed. And then we also saw this chart showing the entropy change as you increase the temperature of a substance, which of course will cause the state change as well. And uh, we can see that as you increase the temperature, the entropy increases because the particles are moving faster as the temperature increases. And also, if you change from solid to liquid, the entropy is going to have a major increase as the same when you increase from, when, when, when the state change from liquid to gas, there is an even bigger increase in the entropy because you can see that compared to solid, liquid, and gas, gas has what? The most dispersed or most what? Randomized system compared to liquid and the solid themselves, okay, themselves. So, the reason, okay, the reason the Newton's cradle would not, okay, would not restart by itself, or we should say, once the heat gets dissipated in the air, then the heat will no longer go back to restart the ball. It's because of the second law of thermodynamics, which states the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. Meaning the whole universe, the entropy has to what? Has to increase constantly all the time. Okay, all the time. After the ball stops, Okay, after this pops, the potential energy of the balls become what? Become a randomized or dispersed motion of heat around the balls. So the whole universe entropy due to this process, what? Increased. If you want to restart the ball and change the heat back to the, uh, and organize the movement of the ball, you're basically against the second law of, of, of thermodynamics. So because of the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy is constantly increasing. This process increased the entropy of the whole universe because an organized form of potential or kinetic energy is transformed into what? Into unorganized, dispersed heat in the atmosphere, into the surrounding atmosphere, okay? And here I have a few examples showing you the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, the first example is you put carefully put a layer of cream on top of a coffee, for example. And even though you're very carefully pouring the, these two layers and you can see a very clear separation, but without stirring after a certain amount of time, you would see that the, these two, 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 two liquids start to up. To mix, eventually you still get a nice cup of coffee, even without a stirring, which is demonstrate what? 
because the molecules of these two solutions or two mixtures are keep constantly moving and causing the entropy what increases and after you get a copper you will never see them what to go back to the separate so you can see that the whole process costs the system and also the universe to become more and more what random and dispersed random and distorted okay and another example and also something you are familiar with uh, Imagine you have a bottle of perfume or anything that smells, okay, old, good or bad. You open the bottle and even you don't pour the, the, the liquid outside, you leave the bottle open, you leave the bottle all in. As long as the solution, the, the molecules are volatile like a perfume, okay, eventually, okay, you leave the bottle on the desk, eventually the whole room is going to what? Smell that perfume. Okay, the reason is the same. The system or the whole universe entropy is increasing. The molecules themselves will spontaneously what? Become more and more dispersed, or the energy will become more and more dispersed. And finally, and something fun is you always find your room what? Get messier and messier instead of by itself become more organized again, right? If you want to organize the room, you have to what? You have to input what? Energy. energy. You, you may wonder, hey, I, I, I can organize my room, then what, what, what? When I organize my room, the entropy actually, what, decrease, right? Becomes more organized. But if you think about that way, when you organize the room, the entropy does decrease for your room. But what you have to do? You have to work maybe two hours. You have to sweat a lot. You have to use a lot of your energy. But if you consider the whole universe, including you, you're sweating, you're releasing heat, you have to take a shower, everything, and including your, the entropy of the universe is still going to what? Increase. What you decrease entropy is only the local of your room. But if you add yourself, the entropy of the universe is still going to what? Increase. Okay, increase. That brings us to this topic. Okay, someone, uh, when we talk about the second law of thermodynamics is, uh, the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing, but okay, but in a local environment, okay, in a system, the entropy does or could be decreased. Okay, for example, when we put some water in, in a freezer, what happens? The water will become what? Become ice. And when water becomes ice, we know water liquid becomes solid. The entropy is actually what? Decreasing. Okay, decreasing. But this is just for the water. If you consider in order to freeze the water, what the, what would we do? We need energy from what? From the freezer. And your freezer is going to blow out a lot of heat. If you feel the, the freezer, the, the, the vent, it's actually releasing a lot of heat. So if you consider the water and the freezer and the energy you use together, the whole universe entropy is still going to what? Increase. Okay, you're causing more entropy increase in the in the freezer, then the entropy decrease for the local ice. Okay, hold on. So again, locally, okay, locally, something you can still decrease the entropy. Okay, decrease the entropy. But if you consider the universe as a whole, okay, as a whole, the entropy is going to constantly increase. Okay, increase. So those are the first part. Okay, first part. We didn't get a finish for the first part of the chapter, talking about the basics of energy and the basics of thermodynamics. Okay, then starting this, in the second part, we're going to discuss the chemistry of these fossil fuels, which we're going to use in, in, in the combustion reaction. So first is the chemistry of coal, okay, the solid fossil fuel. Coal, we know, is a normally dark color, solid. But as for its chemical composition, coal is a very complex mixture of substances. Even though it is a complex mixture, okay, we don't actually know the chemical composition of, 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 of coals in general. But in this book, okay, or in some scientific literatures, I, I don't know where they got this formula, but in this book, at least, we can approximately formulate the formula of coal into this okay c135 uh the hydrogen 96 oxygen 9 and n and s as you can see this chemical formula 
we can first tell, okay, we can first tell coal is composed of what? Five elements. But if you add and consider these subscripts, you can tell the coal, the majority of coal is what? It's carbon. Okay, it's carbon. And there's a simple question. Actually, you're going to use this, uh, use this calculation a lot. How do we calculate the mass percent of carbon in coal? How do we do that? If we want to do that, we actually talk about yeah, this topic in, 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 in previous chapters. How do we do that? Isn't it, um, we use we like, get the full, the, the total, the mass of the full thing, right? Mass of the full thing, and then what? We use mass of the carbon, right? 12 oh, yeah. times how many carbon? 135. 135. So those are the, all the carbons in what? In the formula of coal. Divide by what? Divide by the, you said the whole. So carbon plus not hydrogen plus oxygen times 9 plus nitrogen is 14 and what? Sulfur is 32. I think the bottom one is 1906, because I've done this many times. And the top one, let me see, 12 times 135, 12 times 135, which is 1620. Okay, 1620. So this is what? This is the mass ratio of carbon in what? In coal. If you do a divide, 1620 divided by 1906, you got approximately 85% if you want. Does it make sense? So that means what? In the coal, 85% by mass is what? It's carbon. Okay, it's carbon. All right? And, and again, remember these two numbers. We're going to use them in the next uh, in part of this chapter to do some calculations about the, about the chemistry of coal. Okay? And... Uh, Besides that, again, these are the main elements of coal. And besides that, some coal samples does contain trace amount of other elements, okay, such as silicon, sodium, calcium, nickel, copper, zinc, lead, and mercury. These are very trace amount. And also depends on the source of coal and where the coals are, are harvested and, and mined. Okay, so with that, let's take a look at a few calculations and also uh, use that to review what we studied in chapter 3 about the chemistry calculations. Okay, the first question is, again, they give you the formula of coal. And they ask you to calculate the mass of carbon in tons in 1.5 million tons of coal. So these are the key infos. If I have 1.5 million tons of coal, What is the mass of carbon in what? In tons. Okay, like we did before. If I give in 1.5 million tons of coal, million is what? 10 to the 6. So 1.5 million ton, T stands for ton, also coal. I use this to multiply. Remember, when we're giving coal, we want no carbon. Is that right? So we put what? The mass of coal in the bottom and the mass of carbon and what? In top. 135 times what? Times 12. Okay? 135 times 12 over 1906. You don't you can see that there's actually no unit, but we actually can put what? We can put tons. On what? On both. You can put grams, you can put kilograms, you can what? You can put tons. So bottom line is if you put the mass of coal in the bottom, coal and coal can what? Can cancel. So what we need to do is 1.5 million times 1620 divided by what? 1906. If we only cancel coal, what happened? We end up with tons of what? Tons of carbon. Is that right? You see that? So after the, the math, I, I got the answer already. For 1.5 million tons of coal, I have 1.275 million tons of what? Carbon in it. Make sense? Okay, we use something given multiplied by what? By the conversion. What is the conversion? The mass ratio of carbon in what? 
in coal, and we put coal and the bottom. Okay, in the bottom. Next question. Okay, next question. They ask us how much energy do you think we can release by burning this much coal? 1.5 tons, million tons. How much energy do we need? To, can we burn? And they also tell us for burning this coal, one gram can release what? 30 kilojoules of energy. So that's the only thing given. And also there's another conversion about tons and pounds and pounds and grams. So we were given, this is the key info. 30 kilojoules per what? Per gram. Okay, this info tells what? The energy is related to what? To mass in grams, right? But if you look at the given, this mass of coal, what is the mass of coal? 1.5 million what? Tons. We're not given grams, we're giving what? Tons. So the first thing you now know, in order to get the energy, I first need to convert this ton into what? Into grams. Right? Into grams. And if we know the grams, we know what? We know kilojoules. So here is our work. Use 1.5 ton times, the question told us, one ton is what? 2,000 pounds. So one ton. See that? I put tons in the bottom, right? Because I want to cancel tons. And the top is what? 2,000 pounds. And then after this, I get pounds. I further multiply one pound is what? 454 what? Grams. So pounds in the bottom, I cancel the pounds, I get what? I get grams. And then I after I got grams, I can multiply one gram, which release what? 30 kilojoules. Yeah, you can see that tons of coal, tons of coal cancel. Pounds, pound cancel. Grams, grams cancel. We only end up with what? Kilojoules. Okay, if you do the math again, multiply this, then divide by, of course, divide by one. You get 4.09 times 10 to the 13 kilojoules of energy. Does this make sense? Okay, those, this is again something we practice a lot in chapter three about chemical calculations. Okay? Number three. Okay, after we do number three, I'll leave this one to you, number four. Okay, two, 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 three, you know, self. Even I, I put it here, I want you to use that as, as, a, as, a, as a practice. Okay, number three. What is the mass of CO2 when you burn 1.5 million tons of coal? The mass of CO2 when you burn 1.5 million tons of coal. Now, if you think about it, think about it. The reason burning coal will release CO2 is because of what? Where does the C in CO2 come from? Coal. What? Which, which element of coal? Oh, carbon. Carbon, right? So the CO2 in released from burning coal is coming from what? Coming from what? Carbon in coal, right? So these two guys are related. One carbon will give what? One CO2, because we know during reactions, atoms will never be what? Created or destroyed. Whatever the carbon in CO2 is, generated, the carbon actually is from what? From the carbon in what? In coal. And we know the mass of CO2 is what? 44. And the mass of carbon is what? 12. Is 12. So these two numbers are the ones that relate the amount of carbon to what? To the amount of what? CO2. 44 and 12. So now if you take a look, how do we, how much carbon do we have? We actually did it in previous question. In this much tons of coal, how much carbon do we have? 1.275 million tons of what? Carbon, right? So then I multiply this carbon, multiply by 12 carbon, top 44 
CO2, right? Because we know CO2 is related to what? To carbon. So I multiply 44 over 12. Why do I put carbon in the bottom? Because I want what? Cancel the amount of carbon, right? So basically, is this number multiplied by 44, divided by 12, you get what? This million tons of CO2. They asked what mass. They didn't ask mass in grams. I can leave it in what? Tons, right? The unit doesn't change. I don't even care to you. All I need is cancel the C, get what? Get a CO2. Million tons, a million tons, I don't even change because that is mass. Ton is a mass, right? Even though something mass we don't use a lot, but it's a mass number. I don't need to worry about converting to grams if they don't ask us. This makes sense? Okay, and finally, number four. Okay, number four. They ask you how many molecules of CO2 will be released. From number three, we know what? The mass of CO2. Is that right? Number four asks us to convert this mass of CO2 into what? Into how many molecules? Again, this is work. I, I hope you can use it as a, as a practice. Okay, as a practice. But take a quick look. Do you understand these conversions? Yes. First, ton to what? To pound. Pound to grams. Grams to moles. Mole to what? Number, right? Because one mole is what? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. See that? All these three steps is trying to convert that many tons to what? To grams. And after we get grams, we know carbon dioxide is 44 grams per what? Per mole. And then one mole is what? 6.02 times. Again, uh, try to work on these questions. You can see that we're actually using multiple conversions. Okay, the purpose is basically changing from one unit to a, to another. Okay, that's the basics of chemical calculations. Okay, chemical calculations. Right? So after doing these calculations, let's go back to the topic of coal. Okay, we know coal is a mixture, can be approximated into this formula. And because of that, okay, because of that, there are a few drawbacks of using coals. Something drawbacks you have heard already, something you may not fully realize. Okay, so here Harden summarized drawbacks of using coal. The first one is underground mining of coal is a very dangerous process. Okay, I, I don't know if you I've heard a lot of lot of reporting about casualties from what undermining of coals. Okay, undermining of coals. Number two is coal is a dirty fuel. Okay, not only burning coal releases sulfur oxide, releases mercury if the coal contains mercury element, and also burning coal, the efficiency is not high, so burning coal can also release PMs and soot. And finally, burning coal because of the carbon, it releases what? Greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide. Now, for these three drawbacks, okay, for these three drawbacks, this one, of course, we can improve by what? We can improve by, by improving the, the techniques involved in, in coal mining. Okay, this one, there's no way you can get around around with unless you decrease the amount of using coal using. Otherwise, you're always going to release carbon dioxide. But this one, okay, this one, the dirty fuel drawback of coal can actually be solved using modern technologies. Okay, these are three very commonly and important technologies in making coal from a dirty fuel to a cleaner one. Okay, to a cleaner one. The first technology is called coal washing. Okay, washing means remove those dirty elements, okay, such as sulfur or such as those mineral impurities, including mercury. Remove those elements before you what? You burn them. Okay, you burn them. But of course, you cannot remove carbon because you're still burning carbon. But you can remove these minor dirty elements to wash the coal. Okay, the second technology, okay, also we use them a lot, is to convert coal 
okay, which is a solid fuel into a mixture of gas fuel, okay, gas fuel such as carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas, okay, of course using uh, some transformations. And the resulting gas, not only, not only do they burn at a lower temperature, they also reduce the generation of sulfur oxide or nitrogen oxides because they're burning at lower temperature. Of course, this process needs some extra energy, but it's cleaner for burning coal. Because gasification, changing from solid coal into, a, into some gas fuel. Okay, these are both combustible gas, carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. Okay, the third technology which is used, I think the, the most common, is called wet scrubbing. That is, chemically remove one of the main dirt or the main pollutant released from burning coal, that is sulfur dioxide, before it goes up to the smokestack, I mean, before it's released from the chimney to the atmosphere. So basically, you put something on or inside the, this, the smokestack that can remove SO2. So when you release the exhaust from burning coal, you're releasing less what? Less sulfur oxide. Okay, less sulfur oxide. This is accomplished by reacting SO2 with a mixture of some uh, base compound, like such as brown limestone compound. And also, because of this technology, we can use the sulfur trapped from the burning of coal to make sulfuric acid or some sulfur oxide products okay, by, as a byproduct. So these three are very common and important technologies of making coal a cleaner, okay, a cleaner fuel. Okay, the other two, again, we have other technologies, and especially the third one, there's no way around unless you reduce the amount of fossil fuels okay, in total. Okay, next. Coal has been burning, I mean, used for, 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 for a longer time until recently. Okay, until so recently. As you can see from this chart, the shift from coal to oil only happened in mid-1950s, brought on by the, by the Texas oil boom. You probably know it better, what Texas oil boom. Okay, 1950 also marked the first year that petroleum surpassed coal as the main energy source in the United States. Okay, let's take a look at this chart. You can see that the petroleum is in, in the green line, coal is the purple, and uh, natural gas, etc. You can see that the using of coal uh, started increasing and actually recently what decreased, but the use of petroleum is actually what keep increasing, keep increasing. Okay, I, I heard some news, okay, I heard some news. The use of petroleum, okay, petroleum or other fossil fuels is actually not at peak yet. It may peak at the year around 2050. Then people may start to use more about this renewable energies, but they will start to decrease. So the trend of increasing the use of petroleum and coals are actually still going to see increase. Okay, maybe less coals, but the use of petroleum is still going to what? Going to increase. And I don't know if you have heard of that theory, but we are too young. When we're at middle and high school, our general, our, our education was, was was received was because coal and petroleum, like we learned last time, they're what? They're not renewable, right? Once they're used up, they're what used up. And we were told, I mean, we're taught the petroleum will exhaust by the speed of the, what we're using, what we were using when I was the student, will exhaust or, or deplete by the year of 2015. Apparently, it's not the case. We're actually getting more and more petroleum in these years. Like I told you, the new, new news I have reported, the peak use of petroleum will be around what? 2050, not exhaust, not plate. One of the main reason, okay, one of the reasons is of course people find more what? More petroleum than before. Okay, when I was little, probably people haven't found this large field of petroleum yet. But another very important 
breakthrough of petroleum is shown here. Okay, shown here. Okay, shown here. Normally, oil is not found in 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 big pool of undergrounds. Okay, they're actually within the the gaps or the pores of of rock formations such as sandstones. Because those are very some 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 detailed techniques you can read more. But the breakthrough of Getting petroleum or getting a large amount of petroleum that can satisfy for, for the next maybe 20 or 30 years is a technology called fracking. Okay, I don't know if you have heard of fracking. Fracking is basically technology that you you squeeze water into underground and the water kind of increases the pressure of the fixtures and the squeeze the oil out of the ground. Okay, kind of increase the, the pressure and squeeze the oil. Again, oil are naturally in the, in the underground pools. They're, what, they're hidden inside within the rocks and layers of the rocks. So this technology, okay, this technology, of course, in the United States started, is used very commonly nowadays to what? To obtain petroleum and natural gas from hard rock formations such as shade, such as shell. And, and again, this, uh, this is a new technology, and, and I, I actually assign you guys to uh, read more articles okay, and do your research, okay, some reliable sources from Google, you can do that, and find out what fracking is, what is the technology. And also, besides that, also read something about the disadvantage of using fracking. Okay, fracking is actually a debatable technology. It will cause some changes for the geology, for example, of, 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 of certain areas, or some other consequences. And it also, there are a lot of news and medias are actually posting against this technology. But again, fracking is a very big breakthrough that will get us a lot more petroleum than ever we can imagine. Okay, but again, this is the chapter four discussion, and do more research and, and take a look write something about what fracking is, what do you think about fracking, and also what do you know about the drawbacks of this technique of getting petroleum. Good? All right, next, let's take a look. The, the gold oil, okay, the golden oil that everybody is, is fighting for, petroleum, what it is, okay, what is the component, and what does it look like, and what is the chemistry of it. Okay, petroleum is a liquid, okay, it's a very thick liquid. The color of petroleum ranges from clear golden to black terry, that is thick liquid. Okay, very similar to coal. Petroleum, or we call them crude oil, is also a mixture, okay, also a mixture. It contains a mixture of thousands of compounds. But, okay, but those compounds are all carbon containing compounds. The number of carbon can range from one to as many as six carbons per molecule. So it is a huge mixture of carbon containing compounds. But even though it is a mixture, okay, there are a lot of carbon containing compounds in petroleum, but the majority of these carbon containing compounds are called hydrocarbons. Okay, are called hydrocarbons. And most of the hydrocarbons in Portugal naturally is, is between number five, five carbons to 12 carbons. And if you recall that, if you recall that, we studied hydrocarbons in chapter one, are actually compounds containing O1. Containing what? carbons and hydrogens. Okay, hydrogens. Now in petroleum, most of the hydrocarbons are a class of compounds called alkenes that can be represented using a general formula, CnH2n plus two. That means these alkenes Okay, these hydrocarbons can be predicted using this general formula to figure out their 
molecular formula. If we know the number of carbons, we can actually calculate the number of hydrogens by using the number of carbon times 2 plus 2 plus another 2. For example, okay, for example, this chart shows some alkenes in petroleum. Okay, petroleum. This chart only listed alkenes ranging from number one carbon or one carbons to eight carbons. As you can see here, when carbon number is one, hydrogen number is two times one plus two, which is four. When carbon number is two, the hydrogen number is two times two plus two, which is six. When carbon number is three, hydrogen number is two times three plus two, which is eight. When carbon number is four, then hydrogen is 10. Carbon number is five, two times five plus two is 12, et cetera. Carbon number is eight, two times eight plus two, which is 18. Okay, these are the first eight alkenes. And also you can see that all the alkenes, their names end with what? A and E. Okay, A and E. The difference between their names is the prefix of the names, which indicate the number of carbons. Methane, the prefix M E T H means one carbon. E T H means two carbons. P R O P propane means Three carbons. P U T means four carbons. Okay, this one you probably know. Pen P E N T. Pent means what? Five carbons. Okay, Pentagon means what? The the, the, the homeland mm -hmm. security five, five. defense building. Five corners, right? Pentagon five. Okay, again these prefix tell us the number of carbons. Okay, they all end with A and E. Now these are molecular formulas. But in this chart, they also show you the structures. You can see that. Can you see that? In these molecules, no matter from one carbon to two carbon to eight carbons, they are actually built on what? Built on carbons. You see that carbon is actually the what? Like if you have a fish, that what? The backbone, the big bone of what? Of, of the fish, of the molecule. Of course, the hydrogens are what? Are like muscles. They're building on the, on the, on the, on the carbons. And we call this, this the structural formula, just like our Lewis structures, the structural formula of these hydrocarbons. Okay, and of course, when you show all the bondings between C and C and C and H, the structure is gonna be what? Too too much, too big, too complicated. These are only eight carbons. If you have like nine or ten or eleven, you're probably gonna run out of space when you draw a structure. So in order to make it prettier, we also use condensed structure by what by taking away all the single bonds we don't show that single bond we know the single bonds are there we don't show the single bonds for example you can see that this carbon has what three hydrogen to it so we change it to a what to a ch3 these carbons have two hydrogens on each one so they change to what to a ch2 so we don't show the bondings but we know the bonds are there and we call these structures condensed structures Okay, again, if you ever, in the future, study or read something about organic chemistry, these are how they represent structures of alkenes. Okay, alkenes. okay, like we said, again, the hydrocarbons, names are a combination of prefix and suffixes. Okay, the prefix is denoting the number of carbons, meth, eth, prop, B U T pentex, these are what? The number of carbon ranging from number one to number ten. Decane is ten carbons, just like a decade. Okay, the suffix tells you what type of molecules they are. Okay, most of the hydrocarbons are alkanes. They end with A and E. There are some other type of hydrocarbons. For example, if the hydrocarbon contains a double bond, a CC double bond, those hydrocarbons are called alkenes. If a hydrocarbon contains a CC triple bond, we call those hydrocarbons alkynes. So it depends on what type of molecule we use different suffixes. Okay, the prefix tell us the number of carbon, the suffix tell us what? The type of molecule. 
If there's the only single bond, like these guys, we call them what? We call them alkenes. Okay, they are all with A and E. But if there's a double bond, then the molecule will be called what? Alkenes. If there's a triple bond, then they're called alkynes. We have a few examples uh, when we study the chemistry of petroleum uh, in the last part of this chapter. Okay, again, these are how do we name these compounds? How do we name these compounds? And also, okay, something we studied in chapter one as well. Okay, something we study in chapter one as well. The combustion of hydrocarbons is basically breaking down the whole hydrocarbon molecule, breaking down all the C and H's, the bond between C and H's, and the C combined with the oxygen to give what? CO2. The H combined with oxygen to give what? H2O. Okay, we have seen this reaction many times in chapter one. That is, again, the true here, the same here. Any hydrocarbons, if they undergo complete combustion, then the C and H bonds will be fully broken down and the elements of C and H will both combine with oxygens to give us the final product that's our what? CO2 and what? And H2O. Okay, and H2O. So these are all the same products. The only thing is if you have different numbers of hydrocarbons, of, of um, different numbers of C and H's, you have to what? Balance the equation differently. Okay, but the products will always be CO2 and H2 because they are made by what? C and what? H and H. Okay, and H. Now, these are, of course, the, the main products of CO2, uh, of, of combustion hydrocarbons, but the actual combustion is not that simple okay, because besides hydrocarbons, there are maybe some impurities, for example, sulfur is involved, and also because the combustion needs high temperature or pr 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 produce a high temperature, nitrogen in the atmosphere can also react with oxygen to produce nitrogen oxide. Something we also mentioned that, for example, burning uh, fuels in a car engine, the car engine will produce what? Nitrogen oxide, even though fuel does not contain nitrogen. Nitrogen in the air can react with oxygen in hot or high temperature. In high temperature. Next. Okay, next, we know petroleum is a very nasty mixture of these hydrocarbons, ranging from what? One carbon to all the way to 60 carbons on top, can, can all the way up to 60 carbons. So the biggest question is, the petroleum product, okay, the petroleum product, such as the one we use today, like diesel, like gasoline, like propane, right? You have propane tank. They're all single products. So they're what? They're purified. So the biggest question is how do we separate these hydrocarbons, which are very similar. The only difference is the number of carbons is different. How do we separate them or how the oil industry separate these hydrocarbons for our commercial uses? Okay, changing from crude oil to all kinds of what? Fuels in our daily lives. Okay, this separation is based on a very important physical property of these hydrocarbons that is called the boiling point of it. Okay, the boiling point of it. Of course, boiling point is what? The temperature at which the boil. Okay, they change from liquid to gas. Now, hydrocarbons, they are different in the number of carbons. That will cause them have different strength of intermolecular forces. Okay, you may find what is intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces between what? between molecules. When molecules have more carbons or the size is bigger, then the forces within or between the molecules, the intermolecular forces are stronger. Stronger means what? Harder to separate these molecules. So think about if the molecules are harder to separate, the boiling point will be what? You need higher temperature or lower temperature to, to separate them. If they're harder to separate, higher. higher temperature. So that tells us what? If the molecule has more carbons because this, the forces are stronger, their boiling point what? will be higher. Then, of course, the molecule, if there are fewer numbers, the boiling point will be what? Lower. Will be lower. 
So based on that, we have this device called a distillation tower. Okay, what happens is when you put the oil, the, put, the crude oil in a boiler, boil it, the ones with fewer numbers will what? Boil faster. They will rise up because they're gas, right? After boiling, they're gas. They will rise up to where? To the top or upper part of the tower. The one with more carbons will boil slower. They will what? Be at the lower part of the tower. So you can see that if we have layers of the tower, the top towers will be ranging from four carbons, five to 12, 12 to 16, and the bottom one will be what? Will be the heavy ones from, from bigger than 20 or even bigger than 50. And of course, we can take them out after, after separated, being separated in the distillation tower. Okay, for example, carbon number one to four, they're refinery gases. Carbon from five to 12, they're used as gasolines. 12 to 16, they're as jet fuels, diesels, and we call this technique, of course, distillation. But they're based on what? Boiling point. And boiling point is dependent on what? Motor mass, right? Smaller motor mass means what? Lower boiling point. Larger motor mass means what? Higher boiling point. Okay, higher boiling point. Here's a picture of, this, of, of the distillation tower. You can see that? In the refinery, this is a picture of a refinery, oil refinery. You can see that these these big towers, okay, these big towers are distillation towers. And of course, sometimes they burn the top, okay, the gas, and burn it. The, the, the mostly, of course, the one burned are mostly natural gas, okay, with fewer number of carbons. Okay. Now, this picture shows where, okay, where or the distribution of a, 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 of some crude of crude oil, for example, a barrel, a barrel of, of crude oil, which is around 43, 40, Where do they go? Okay, what are we are, what are we using them for? Okay, this is a picture showing that the distribution of these different uh, components of crude oils. Okay, the a barrel again is forty two gallons. Okay, after refining, okay, after refining. The volume normally will be slightly bigger than before because some products have a lower density. We know that, but you can see that from this distribution, the distribution: gasoline, heating oil, jet fuel, head fuel, and liquefied refinery gas, such as natural gas, liquefied propane, or liquefied natural gas. You can see that out of 42 gallons, okay, out of 42 gallons, over 87 percent, close to 90 percent is used for what? For fuel, right? Fuel can be either used in transportation and what? And heating. Okay, we burn the fuel for, for heating purposes or we burn the fuel for, for, for provide the, 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 the energy for, for driving different, different automobiles or different trucks, airplanes, etc. But majority of crude oil goes where? goes to fuel, as fuel. But out of the 42 gallons, 7.3 gallons, these part are even more important and sometimes being forgot about is they provide the feed stocks for all carbon-based products. Okay, if you imagine all these mixtures are what? Are carbon compounds, carbon mixed compounds. And a lot of plastics, pharmaceutics, fabrics, anything around them, most of the stuff we, we use nowadays are also what? Organic compounds. And organic compounds are carbon based as well. Where do their carbon from are coming from? Their carbons are from what? From petroleum. So petroleum not only provide us fuels for transportation and heating, they provide us the necessary feedstocks for carbon-based compounds, okay, for all kinds of carbon-based compounds, especially pharmaceutics, fabrics, and, 
in, in, in the plastics. Okay, in the plastics. And finally, okay, finally, the last type of commonly used fossil fuel is natural gas. Okay, natural gas. We only have a very brief uh, description of natural gas. Natural gas is gas normally existing uh, with oil in, in the wells okay, as, a, as a mixture. So when you find, normally find oil, you, you, you also have big chances to find natural gas. They exist as a mixture together. And uh, the natural gas we refer daily, okay, we use daily, that enters our homes are basically pure or almost pure methane, CH4. Okay, now you know this is what the name is, methane, CH4. And of course, because natural gas is odorless, colorless, to detect leaking purpose, uh, natural gas entering our homes are added with odorizers. Okay, very small amount of odorizers, so you can detect the leak. Okay. Because natural gas is practically pure methane, which only contains C and H. So burning natural gas is probably the cleanest fossil fuels we're using nowadays because it doesn't contain what? It doesn't contain other elements. It doesn't contain sulfur, it doesn't contain minerals. So there's no CO2, uh, SO2, or no ashes residues because it's a gas. Burning is much more efficient than burning what? Burning solid or than burning liquid. So natural gas is probably the cleanest source of energy nowadays we're using, okay, the fossil fuels we talk about. But because natural gas contains what? Carbon. It still releases CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, which has a potential of what? Causing we have more greenhouse gas than before. Okay. All right, so next. When we burn a fossil fuel, such as methane, CH4, okay, when we burn these fossil fuels, this one, such as burning very simple fossil fuel CH4. We know the products are CO2 and H2O because carbon and hydrogen are combining with oxygen. And we also know burning any type of fossil fuel, the potential energy of the fossil fuel will be what? Will be released. Heat will be released for these reactions, for burning any type of fossil fuel. And because of the fact heat is released in these reactions, we call those reactions exothermic reactions. Okay, exothermic reactions. In an exothermic reaction, okay, in an exothermic reaction, the reaction heat Okay, the reaction heat, of course, this number in, in, in joule or kilojoules will be assigned a negative sign. Okay, you can see that there's a negative sign. Meaning what? Meaning the energy change for this, these exothermic reactions are what? Negative. Why negative? Because when energy is out, is released, the final product energy will be what? Lower than the starting material. Think about your bank account again. When you take money out, your final balance will be what? Shorter than the initial balance. So if you do a change, what is a change? Your final balance minus your initial balance will be what? Will be negative. So because energy is already going out, so the energy of these guys are lower than what you started with. So the change will be what? Will be negative. So the heat of an exothermic reaction, the sign must be negative. This negative sign tells us what? Energy is what? Released. Does that make sense? Okay, this is very important because we're gonna use that topic in the, in the third part of this chapter. So, here's a picture showing you and help me better understand what are exothermic reactions. Exothermic reaction is basically 
you start with something with higher energy, and after energy is released, you end up with something with what? With lower energy. So the final energy minus the initial energy will be a what? Will be negative sign. Okay, energy released will be assigned a negative sign. And that negative sign again tells nothing but what? But heat released. When you see negative, you know oh, this reaction is exothermic. You're giving out heat. You're giving out money. Okay, just like here, you're going from something high to what? To something low. And of course, during that process, energy is going to what? To release. Okay, just like the water. Here, water has lower potential. This water has higher potential. So when you minus final minus initial, the potential will be what? Will be negative. But this is the difference between these two energies. Okay, for natural gas, for example, is 802 kilojoule per, per mole. Okay, per, per, mole. per mole means what? Per mole means one mole of natural gas will release how much energy? 802.3 kilojoules of energy. Okay, one mole of natural gas, because you can see the balance reaction is what? One mole, right? In front of natural gas is one mole. Now, it's a very quick question, something we review about we did before. The heat of combustion for natural gas is given as one mole, uh, uh, this many kilojoule per mole. Can you calculate the m amount of energy released per gram of natural gas instead of per mole? Okay, here is how do we convert if needed? We know one mole of natural gas is how many grams? 16 grams, because carbon is 12, hydrogen is what? It's four. So one mole of natural gas is 16 grams. One mole release this much energy, why well, multiply one mole over 16 grams. Mole and mole canceled, we end up with a unit of what? Kilojoule per gram. So. Again, the sign is always kept. The sign tells us what? Energy is released. Okay, so one more of natural gas release 802.3 kilojoule. One gram of natural gas actually release what? 50.1 kilojoules. Okay, if, we, if needed, we can do this calculation. Basically, you use 803, 802.3 divided by 16. Because what? Because one more natural gas is 16. Next, okay, next, is a comparison. Okay, comparison. I want to save the second one for you to work as well, but I want to show you how do we work on this type of calculation using the first one example, and then you can compare with score. Okay, the first one asks us to calculate the mass of CO2 released if we want to produce 15 kilojoules of heat. Assuming we're burning natural gas. Okay, assuming we're burning natural gas. Again, they ask us to calculate how much CO2 mass will be released if I want to produce 15 kilojoules of heat. Now first, okay, from, if I don't give you that, you probably even don't know where to start with. 15 kilojoules of energy is what we, we're, we're producing. They ask us what? The mass of CO2. Is that right? The mass of CO2, if you take a look at this reaction, the mass of the CO2 is determined by the mass of what? Methane, CH4. Because C is from what? From that C, right? So the mass of CO2 is determined by the mass of CH4. How are they related? What is the mass of CO2? 44 here. What is the mass of CH4 here? 16, right? 12 plus 4, 16. So we know that the mass of these two are related. They ask what is the mass of CO2. So if I know the mass of CH4, then what? problem solved, right? How do we relate the mass of CH4 to the heat? We just did it. 
one gram of CH4 produce what? This much heat. So here, take a look what I'm doing here. I produce this much heat. I multiply 50.1 kilojoule is what? One gram of CH4. This is what we just produced. We convert kilojoule per mole to kilojoule per what? Per grams. I put kilojoule in the bottom because I want to what? Cancel kilojoule. And then after this, I get grams of CH4. But the question asks what? Mass of CO2. So I multiply 16 grams of CH4 and what? 44 grams of CO2. Does it make sense? And then I get this 82.3 grams of CH4. So that means if I want to burn to produce 1,500 kilojoules of energy, I need to release this much of CO2. 82.3 kilojoules, uh, grams of CO2. Okay, this is the first exercise. And when you go home, I want you to think about it or try this. If you want to produce the same amount of heat, 15 hydro kilojoule, but if you don't use natural gas, if you use coal, how much CO2 is going to prepare? Basically, ask us to compare what? Compare burning coal or burning natural gas to produce the same amount of energy. Make sense? Which one gives more what? CO2. So think about it again. The answer key is here. I even chose for you this coal is one we choose and think about. Of course, you can see the answer. We, we, if you burning coal, you produce more what? CO2. But I want you to take a look. Okay, this question is even they're, they're putting together is kind of like a boring calculations, but actually tells us something. Okay, first is if how do we get the amount of CO2 figured out for a certain amount of heat? And then if we think about it, to produce the same amount of heat, heat, instead of using natural gas, you use coal. Here, even in here in my solution, I choose the best coal. This coal can produce the most amount of heat. Then how much CO2? Will be produced. Okay, how much CO2 will be produced? All right, so I think that is one we can stop today. I think next time we're going to talk about this device and uh, discuss how do we figure out, okay, how do we figure out the heat of a reaction by using the experiment? Because you actually will build this device in one of your HOL labs. Yes. I mean, of course, not this fancy, but you're going to build a simplified version of it using the kit provided. All right, so let me stop recording. We can stop here.